All right. Uh, series one is going to be a Remington core locked, correct? Yes. That's what those are. 150 grain. 150 grain core locked. This series. is what the gun is sighted in with. Got that one. 2076. Shot three, 2069. Shot two, 2067. Shot one, 2076. I hit that. No. Number of shots four, standard deviation 6.3, extreme spread of 13. Start with 30 grains. It's not going to make a whole lot of noise. 1993. 1993. We'll write that down right there. I'll number one. 30. Yep. and a half and when we get further down the line we'll start looking for any signs of pressure right now we're not going to see any signs of pressure That's one of them where we had a big jump. match another bullet to it that has roughly the same bearing surface and around the same weight if you, as long as you can match the velocity of a different bullet it will shoot real close to the original group with, after you get fine after you get custom you know first round of custom ammo done there 32.5 
tough even even as much as this barrel band mm -hmm. when if it gets hot and swells up that's enough to affect the, the harmonics of the whole the barrel and everything one of them where we had a big jump. They've got good rounded edges on the primer still. Uh, there is no ejector marks on the rim. Now on a lever action rifle the ejector is in the side of the receiver. You don't see typical ejector marks like you would on a bolt action rifle because of the difference in the placement of the ejector. What you will see if you have a case with high pressure in a lever action rifle, you'll see the ejector marks on the side, on the case rim, right on the, on the back edge of the rim uh, due, for, due to case head expansion. When the case comes back and starts rubbing on the extractor, it will put two little grooves or a really good shiny mark on there. We're not seeing that here. Uh, the extractor, the claw on the extractor will be on the front side. I have some some of my rifles are two and a half, three grains over a book max charge. Zero pressure signs, uh, no marks on the brass, no sticky bolt, and, and uh, shooting half inch groups at 150 yards. Now we can take uh, this data and we'll try to uh, chart it. Remington core lock with six rounds. We had an average velocity of 2270. Highest was 2378. Lowest was 2066. That's an extreme spread of 312 feet per second and a standard deviation of 119 feet per second. Series two, which were the 30-30 FTX's we, that I had loaded. We got a the chronograph to read four shots. Average of 2,073 2, feet per second. Highest 2,080 feet per second. The lowest was 2,067 feet per second. What grain were those? 100, 160 grain FTX's. I mean, what was your powder loads? Uh, would have been 31 grains of match rifle, shooter to world match rifle. Extreme spread of 13 feet per second and a standard deviation of 6.3 feet per second. Series 3, which was our ladder test, we had a 366 feet per second extreme spread. Our lowest velocity was 1993, our highest velocity was 2359. This information, the extreme spread, standard deviation, doesn't come into play because we have a six grain powder charge difference from start to finish. And what we're looking for is a spot in this velocity where it starts to level off. Uh, right in here is shot number six. We had a 2141. Shot number seven, we had a 2149. Shot number eight, we had a 2174. So we had a 33 feet per second spread across a grain and a half. We go to nine, uh, shot number nine, it's 2197. We had a 56 feet per second spread across two grains variance in charge weight on powder. And we've got a couple of high velocities here and we drop we start climbing back up and we drop off and we start climbing back up again. We had sticky extraction on this charge weight right here. So we're not going any higher than that. Uh, this velocity dropping off is leaving the barrel, the bullets leaving the barrel at a completely different time than this velocity here. So that's no good. This would have been okay 
if we had more than one or more than two at this close to velocity. So we're starting to open our spread back up right in here. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start, we're actually, well, we can chart this and look at the actual chart, but we're going to start at load number six and we're going to load a few at 32 and a half and we'll go 33 and we'll go 33 and a half. Uh, 34 was a pretty decent jump. I don't think we need to go up to there, but we can include 34. We'll see it on the chart and in our flat spot real easy across those four. Those powders do not dispense in those dispensers uh, in the Dillon powder drops very accurately. Mm -hmm. 0.3 to 0.5 grain variance over 20 rounds, 20 charges. And they need to be done on an electronic dispenser or done by hand across the scale. Because they're such large chunks, right? Yep. You need to do like that stuff right there to, to fall through and measure correctly. Yep. And then that, the, once we figure out an actual charge weight, I can load these off of that and still get within a uh, uh, six standard, six feet per second standard deviation like we did with uh, the four rounds that we shot of those out there. And that's that powder is a is a fine ball powder in them, and that's what I did. I put my dispenser different powder dye on here, and I loaded them with that after I found the load uh, using that. But any of the any of the extruded powders, I uh, so you can pretty much custom load anybody anything they need here. Uh, virtually anything. Um, a lot of common we've got basically everything common and I've got stuff like 7 STW, uh, 300 Weatherby mag, there's 270 Weatherby mag, 7 millimeter Weatherby, uh, 458 Winchester mag. Uh, there's there's five or six other different odd uh, 220 Swift, stuff that's, that's not real common anymore. Uh, 7 TCU, I can load it. 22 TCM, uh, 300 Savage, and, and I can get any other set of dies that, that anybody needs. Uh, got the shell plates and the rest of the equipment to do it. So. Here, this is where we started at. Was just a little over 2,000 feet per second. And here's where we ended. It was just below between 23 and 2400. This spot right here where we're is where we're shooting for. This was shot number six, seven, eight, and nine. Uh, shot number six was the 2141. That is that dot. Shot number seven was 2149. Shot number eight was 2174. Shot number nine was 2197. These were the next two that looked like they might have been potential, but then we had a jump and a drop and another pretty good jump, the same as we did down here. Uh, this is starting to rise really fast right here. This is a real slow, gradual rise. And this is where we're gonna be shooting for, is right in between there. Uh, and that's probably gonna be somewhere around shot seven, between seven and eight between six and seven is where we're going to have our best standard deviation. That's why I always reshoot them groups like like that because I had two here and two here. That 34 was kind of over the top. Two and a half. Uh, 33 grain charge weight, a 33 and a half grain charge weight, and a 34 grain charge weight. Uh, the 32 and a half grain charge weight is just below the upper left target. 
we were actually aiming at the middle target on the left side. So they were shooting approximately four inches high, which is fine. Uh, we're just looking at group size here. There are four rounds in that 32 and a half grain charge weight. Uh, we shot the group of 33 grain charge weight, uh, which is the next group down below that. It's labeled 33. They were starting to vertical string just a bit, uh, which is kind of unusual being that close to charge weight, but the barrel obviously didn't like it. The 33 grain charge weight, which is to the far right, just below the middle target, I pulled two of those shots to the right uh, when I was shooting the gun. That group should have been a little bit closer. Uh, the 34 grain charge weight was really starting vertical spread. It's directly above that. It's just moving a little bit too fast. Uh, these bullets seem to be velocity sensitive as far as being able to stabilize properly at this type of distance. After we found two of the charge weights that grouped decently, the 32 and a half grain charge weight and the 33 and a half grain charge weight, we loaded up two five round shots, or two five round loads to verify the group size. I let the customer shoot the 32 and a half grain charge weight, which is just above the bottom middle target uh, was a four shot and it had a high flyer up into the uh, next group up. You can see the line there. The 33 and a half grain charge weight, we ended up with a roughly golf ball size group, inch and a half group up above that. And one had dropped down. Uh, it looks like there was one bullet that went down. The customer believes he might have shot. The customer believes he shot at the uh, lower target instead of the upper target. That's why that line has a squiggly through it. Uh, but we can we verify that load again at 33 and a half grains just to make absolutely sure that it's grouping properly. Uh, the importance of matching the velocity of a bullet to the barrel harmonics, uh, you can plainly see it right here. The, the velocity averages between the Remington core locks and the FTX loads that we ended up with with that smaller group. Uh, it, it's astounding. We had uh, an 11 feet per second standard deviation with the charge that we ended up with on the FTXs, whereas with the Remington core locks we had 168 feet per second standard deviation. That's a little over 350 feet per second extreme spread on the on the core locks. Uh, consistency is the key. You've got to get the exact charge weight in the case. You've got to get the bullet to, seated to the proper depth every time. Uh, that, that, that's what makes the difference. The first load that's up there with the junk with the FTX's. We simply weren't pushing them fast enough. Uh, the bullets weren't going fast enough to stay stable. It's a boat tail uh, ballistic tip design and they need some speed. And that's that's key. Matching the proper velocity to a bullet and that, pro that velocity to a barrel. And that's what helps. That's what helps make accurate ammunition. Uh, you know, you can, people can buy five different boxes of ammunition off the shelf at the store ranging from $22 to $40 a box and not find anything that, that shoots that well. Uh, and then they've got to go back and buy another box and you obviously you can't return it. Uh, so you got to keep buying ammunition until you find what shoots. And when you can't find what shoots then that's when custom ammunition comes into play. Uh, let, we, we spend all the time to find the proper load, the proper powder, the proper bullet, find the proper velocity, and once we get it loaded, that ammunition is, is not more expensive than, than standard off-the-shelf ammunition. 
it's typically the same components, the same powders, the same primers as what would be loaded into a into an off-the-shelf ammunition, and it, it makes a big difference. You know, it takes some time to get this done, and it takes some uh, a good amount of shooting to get it done. We put several bullets down range to find proper load here, uh, loaded several rounds. 